back to the culture call on Praise 93.3 with L. Spencer Smith. Our desire is to reach and empower the community by discussing a cross section of relevant topics from various perspectives that are essential to its growth and interpersonal connections. Be sure to save our call in number 205 752 4800. Be sure to install the free Praise 93.3 app so you can send L. Spencer Smith a message or topic idea. Search for WTSK in your app store. This is the world premiere. Great morning, great morning, great morning, precious people. You know what time it is. That's right. It's time for the award-winning talk show, The Culture Call, with your truly Elspin Smith right here on Praise 93.3790 WTSK. Guess what? It's the place where Tuscaloosa meets the world. And for the next two hours from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m., we're going to be talking a little bit, yeah, about everything from society to sports, education to economics, and from religion to relationships. And as always, we are here to create a safe space to have empowering, provocative, and yes, sometimes controversial conversations. And guess what? You can learn right here and chat it up with us as we learn together Right here on the Culture Call. Want to send, number one, a shout out. Y'all know how we do it. To all of our new Culture Call listeners. Yes, we are glad that you are part of the CC family. I am telling you, we are a family that's tight-knit, that's committed. Yeah, and we love to talk about a whole lot of things, new things that are relevant to our community, the black community. And I'm so grateful and glad that whether you're riding through the city or sitting at your desk or your office, that you tuned in. Yeah, online or wherever you are to listen to the culture call. So welcome, welcome. Listen, shout out number two. I want to send a shout out to all of my committed, uh, committed listeners that you listen to me every day after Brother Jay. Yeah, and you have made this. You, you, I say, have made this the number one talk show in the state of Alabama. And I am grateful for that. Yeah, you keep me on my toes. You encourage me every time you see me. Yeah. And I really, really appreciate you. Pre- appreciate you down from the depths of my heart and my soul. Thank you for being a part of the Culture Call family. And of course, last but not least, the inimitable, awesome, anointed Brother Jay. My goodness, that leads us from 5 a.m. all the way up to the 10 o'clock hour and passes that hot revival baton to me and say, hey, son, go ahead and run on. And I'm going to see what the end going to be. Yeah, I'm telling you, I thank him so much for being an awesome mentor and encouraging me every day to do the work that God has given my hands to do on the culture call. Listen, hey, I want to encourage each and every last one of you to do me a favor. What's that favor, L? Glad that you asked. Go ahead and get your Apple or your Android device and um, open it up. That's right. Go to the App Store. That's right. Each and every, all those phones have App Stores, okay? Go to the App Store and search out Praise 93.3 FM, and there you will see that we have, what, a free 99 app. It does not cost you a thing. Do me a favor and go ahead and download that on your device. That's right. Download that on your device, and you can hear us from wherever you are in the country, and dare I say in the world, so you can keep up what's happening uh, here, not only in Tuscaloosa, but also uh, what's going on in other spots and other places around the country. And you can hear all of our wonderful programming on 93.3. Yeah, I definitely want you to do that. Your inspiration station wants you to do that and definitely lock into the culture call at 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. So no matter where you are, if you're in Bangor, Maine, yeah, New York, New York, if you're in Charlotte, North Carolina, or whether you're right here in the beautiful city of Tuscaloosa, Alabama, Birmingham, Montgomery, Huntsville, that's right, uh, Mobile, wherever you are, Gordo Reform, Aliceville, Utah, Bology, does not matter where you are. You can listen to the Culture Call. We are glad to have you on for the ride. Listen, also, as I say every morning, send me your public service announcements to your events at culturecall.praise at gmail.com. That's culturecall.praise at gmail.com. Because I want to let Lottie Dottie and everybody know what's going on in your neck of the woods, right? And so no matter what's happening at your church, your organization, your fraternity, your sorority, if you're an artist getting ready to release a new record, 
record or have a concert or whether you're preaching, getting ready to start a new church or conduct the revival. I want everybody to know so that they can put their faces in the place so there'll be no space, right, so that you can feel and understand that what you do in our community is important. You know why? Because we do it better when we do it together. And as always, you can go ahead and write down the golden number. I said that's right, the golden number, 205 752 4800. That's 205 752 4800. And you can call in and be a part of the conversation uh, if you so choose to. Or guess what? You can follow me on uh, social media on Facebook. You can go ahead and search out the culture call right there. And you can follow me there. And you definitely can check me out on the app. That ch- app has a chat feature. And you can send me messages there and I'll read them online. You know, some of you don't like your voice online. I'm still trying to figure out what's that about. (laughs) And some of you, mostly a lot of you are at work this time of day. Doesn't matter. You can send it to me on the chat and uh, and we will read it and we will engage it with you. I just want to hear from you. Is that OK? Absolutely. Well, uh, Bishop, maybe I, I missed a, a past episode of of the broadcast of the talk show. No problem. Go to Apple Podcasts and type in Culture Call. Leave out the article, the and Culture Call. And you can see my face there and you'll see all of our past shows because they archive them every day. We want to make sure that you don't miss anything that we talk about because it's all relevant, all important. So do me a favor. Go ahead and sit back and relax. Grab you some coffee. You know how we do it. Maxwell House or Starbucks. And maybe coffee is not your thing. Maybe it's upset your stomach or whatever. Or you can get you some herbal tea. Mm -hmm. If you're trying to calm down, that's chamomile. If you're trying to kick up, that's green tea. That's right. Give you a little caffeine kick. And you can always definitely get you some alkaline water. That's the water with the black label. Black and red, some of them. Uh, my favorite is Essentia. Yeah. It has an 8.8 point, 8 point, uh, 8 plus pH balance a- average. That's right. Helps you with the detox. Get down to that cellul- cellular level. Let's get hydrated and get into the culture. Listen. So much is going on, um, but this week I had purpose not to be political. I'm trying not to be, you know, that's going to come up and probably next month. Next month is when we focus on mental health, and I've got some folks coming on that's going to talk about getting our minds together, becoming emotionally intelligent, and all of those things, helping you to work. This month is Stress Awareness Month, and we're almost at the end of April and that parlays into mental health awareness because stress has something, uh, you know, it has a direct connection to uh, the health of our mental status. And so, yeah, we're kind of trying to bring some things to bear and get you to consider some things um, as you walk in the peace of God, right? Uh, we don't abandon our spiritual context or our spiritual foundations, but we add to our faith, Right. We add to our faith, as Peter tells us, uh, uh, information, knowledge. We have to add to our faith and understanding. And all our getting, we are to get an understanding, right? And so, yes, we do have peace uh, that 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 passive all understanding and it guards our heart and mind. I, I believe that that is etched in my heart and my spirit. However, comma, we also need to recognize that we do have to add to our faith. In other words, yes, I have peace that pass all understanding. But what can I do? Right. That's God's prerogative. Right. To, uh, to he says, I give you peace. But what is my responsibility and obligation to myself and to my world to maintain that status of peace? Right. That uh, Isaiah said he will keep us in perfect peace if our minds stayed on him because we trust him. And so how does that trusting thing works out? That means then I have a stewardship or I have a level of. Of responsibility that I need to make sure that I maintain, that I am, that I'm a good steward over my life, over my affairs, over the experiences that happen to me, right? Uh, That part of the understanding of life now is not just the air I breathe, it's not just the inhales and the exhales, but it is also awareness, right? And we talked about on the other day the difference between being self informed. And self-aware, that's so uh, major as we build a hedge around the areas of our lives that can keep us, uh, our stress to a minimum or even stress-free, if we want to say it like that, right? But life is going to happen. So here's the idea then, life uh, is, is that thing, and here's the perspective that I need us to gain, that life is, we are all subject to the experiences and the phenomenology of life, that those things are going to happen. 
right? <laughs> Things are going to happen. I mean, you know, bills, all relationships. I mean, you name, you list them out, they're going to happen. Uh, there is no sector of humanity that's so des- so desirous of God and so loved by God that uh, they don't experience any kind of stress-related uh, issues or uh, so, stress-related experiences, right? Because we know that he reigns on the just and the unjust, right? In every life, some rain must fall. So we are all subjected to it. But here is the thing. We are not overcome by it. That's powerful. That, yes, we will be subject to it. Yeah, but we are not overcome by it. And so that's important for us to understand. Our Part of our responsibility is to build a hedge around uh, uh, that peace and that area that keeps our lives stable and, 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 and work with that. Work with our faith and, yeah, our trust and knowing, being self-aware that when we have reached certain limits in life, in our lives, that we learn how to pull back and we learn how to bring ourselves into a, a personal Sabbath, right? We know that the Sabbath is, uh, biblically, it says that the Sabbath is, uh, uh, the man was not made for the Sabbath, but Sabbath was made for the man. And number two, that Sabbath is not a particular day of the week. The, our Sabbath is in Christ. Come unto me, all who are weak and are heavy laden, and I will give you Sabbath, right? I will give you rest. And so, you know, it's the mixture of our faith and understanding uh, our spiritual context, but also uh, allowing our souls to prosper, allowing those some 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 uh, non-negotiables to exist in our lives, so that we can maintain a level of a holistic homeostasis, if I can say, the holistic balance uh, in our lives, so that we can do everything that we need to do, that we can fulfill our purpose and uh, live out our ex- the entire extent of our worth. And that we won't be afflicted by what? Disease, disease, right? We won't allow certain psychosomatic sicknesses to come into our lives because we've learned how to guard our hearts with all diligence, our souls. We've learned how to allow them to prosper. We've learned how to rest. We've learned how to gauge ourselves and retreat. We've learned how to meditate. We've learned how to contemplate and and sit in the reality of the promises of God, yes, but also sit in the reality that I am human and we are human beings and and sometimes the doings have to stop so that the being can continue. Let me say it again, that sometimes we have to make the decision for the doings to stop so that we can focus on our being. We are human beings, not human doings. And sometimes we can become so addicted to human doings uh, that we forget to fortify and edify our human being, right? And it, ultimately, it is in him that we live, we move, and what? Have our being. And so, yes, I want you to, I want you to weave it together especially for my community, that we are strongly spiritual, strongly religious. We have a faith context, but I need us to understand that, you know, faith without a particular action or specific action is dead. That's what the Bible says in James, that the word says that without uh, faith without works is dead. And what works is that? That means the actions that I need to take uh, obedient actions that I need to take to do all and to be all that I need to be in God, right? Absolutely. And so I wanted to I wanted to start off with that preamble um, because um, I had the very fortunate opportunity on last night to have a conversation about the the journey and the stress that stress uh, that is associated with grief. Um, I did that at my church. We had a discussion. Um, which was veered off from our normal Bible study last night. And um, my wife was my Oprah. She was my interviewer. And I talked about my newest book, Child Left Behind. And it was specifically for uh, for children or for people who have lost both of their parents, both of their parents. But we expanded the context of the grief talk because I did want to add in the stress around that moment. I did want to add in the the journey around that moment. And I also wanted to bring to light and to bear how, as a community, we often don't make the right choices as a village to help each other, you know, through the whole idea of grief. Number one, grief in and of itself can be very, very stressful, right? Especially if you have been uh, the main caregiver or if you are designated or have been designated in your family to be the strength of the family that 
you know, you are normally the strong one uh, that that handles that handles everything when when grief comes, when someone dies in the family or passes in the family, that everybody kind of looks to you and and places everything on your shoulder. You know, the organizing of the program, informing of the of the people that need to come, handling all of the business in terms of insurance and wills. Uh, being the main contact for the mortuary, you know, keeping all the family fights and conundrums down, you know, making sure everything is organized. Uh, we had a very important conversation about that because, you know, we, we, a lot of things that we, we do or we understand it is understood in silence. And that's not always good because a lot of things need to be, a, a conversation needs to be the foundation proper communication especially around times of grief and uh last night we talked about you know the stress and the struggle i have three brothers uh about two brothers uh it's three of us and just kind of how we dealt with the loss of of each of our parents um my father in uh, uh december of 2015 and my mother in march of 2022 and so how we had to navigate how we helped each other uh how we moved forward and we talked i talked a lot about the stress that grief can bring and a lot of that stress can be brought on uh by a, a willing and a good-hearted but sometimes and please don't get offended when i say this sometimes ignorant church folks that are around you that don't know necessarily how to handle you or walk you through the season of grief. And the season of grief is not something that is temporary. It's not something that is, it is when you've, when you've lost someone that you love, then that thing stays with you forever. I am two years, you know, into the journey with my mom and I am nine years uh, into the journey with my dad. December will be nine years and all of them, you know, uh, strike me every day. There's not a day that I don't think about uh, my dad and my mom. And they affected me in certain ways. And yet, and yet, I've had to navigate uh, the significant losses in my life as a pastor and a leader, right? That, you know, um, that when you, when you, again, when you're the one that normally lives, I had to do all, I mean, what is that? Five significant funerals. My sister, uh, my grandfather, uh, my grandmother, my mom, and my dad. So I had to eulogize five of the most significant people in my foundation. Not just, not just, I, I, and I need people to understand that, that, you know, that these people are, you know, are the ones that I would not be here if it were not for them, you know? And, and so that was a particular level of stress. But having to go through it as a human being and and, and learning how to allow uh, the expression of that grief and my feelings and my emotions during that time and even now to, to give voice to itself, to expose itself is a journey. And if you don't have the right kind of village or community or uh, a, a fam family system, relational systems that can help you through the painful process of dealing with that, it can be so very stressful. And one of the points that I brought out last night, one of the points that I brought out last night is that you cannot, you cannot grieve and fight at the same time. Let me say that again, that you can't properly grieve and be at war in warfare at the same time. Biblically, theologically, grief is a time where all war should cease, right? That when you, when you read in the, in, in old wars and you read in history that, that enemies gave each other time to, to bury their, bury and mourn their dead, right? That, that warfare had to cease because of the respect of the sacredness of the grieving process and the death of those individuals, right? And a lot of times, uh, we talked about last night, a lot of times in our families that we can't even properly agree because brothers are against sister, you know, family dynamics are, have made it, diff, you know, difficult to properly grieve, to properly plan, you know, that when you have siblings, you know, or relationships of that were close to siblings, it is designed for all of us to carry that hurt and the grief because we all experience our parents or our loved ones in different ways, right? And so 
that and that we all have to make room for each of those expressions right and so that is not a time to be fighting over who was the favorite that's not a time to be fighting over who's in charge that's not a time to be fighting over what's in the will or who's in the will or who got mama's pearls or daddy's ties that ain't the time for that <laughs> no no it's the time for the family to come together and wrap the collective arms around each other but what i find found especially as a pastor is that sometimes I've had to step in uh, to deal with the family dynamic of um, the mother that was lost or the father that was lost. And you could walk in the room and you could feel grief and mourning, but you could also feel this kind of unspoken warfare. And if you listen closely, you can hear the snide remarks between siblings and, and the attitudes and the actions. And of course, I know you probably don't know what I'm talking about, but then again, you do. Right. And that that is a place where we have to definitely walk, uh, walk in and we've got to learn how to to dispel warfare and 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 that cantankerousness that can exist around the grieving moment that if if you understand that grieving and the death of a loved one. See, when we look back in and, and, you know, for us black people grieving and and someone passing away. You know, we really don't say dying a lot. We just are passing away our transition. It's an Africanism, right? Because it's a time of, it's a time of a sacred time of both reflection and celebration. We celebrate the life. Yes, we mourn the death, but we celebrate the life of that individual. And so that's a very sacred moment. It's a very somber moment. It's a moment where we come together and we reflect and we project and we, you know, a family of relationships. It's a time also of renewal. And, and so we cannot be, we cannot create, first of all, that person dying is stressful all by itself. When daddy or mama or spouse dies, you know, or anyone that has been close or centrally significant, it could be an aunt or an uncle, whatever that person is, whenever someone that has been, uh, 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 important to the root system of our families pass away in transition that is not a time for fighting it is the time that that the, the death in and of itself is stress is, is stressful right um because of just because of the pain that love has produced right i said on last night that um grief is the longest nightmare that love has ever produced grief is the longest and most painful nightmare that love has ever produced. It's it's such an oxymoronic time, you know? And, you know, we, we there's a whole lot building up. And, you, you know, for us as black folks, we don't necessarily say so-and-so, I'm going to a funeral. We say we're going to the home going, right? Because it is sort of a divine processional where we begin to recognize the person moving from time to eternity, from mortal to immortality. And so, you know, we, we there's a whole lot of celebration, which is why, you know, in our particular culture, we, we how folks say, hold out the body until all the family can get there. We do our best to do that. You know, other cultures, they bury them maybe in two days, three days. Um, but that is not what we do as black folks. We hold them out until the auntie from Alaska can get there and and from the uncle, you know, who's from Liberia, Africa can get over there. We wait for every as many people as we can to get there because yes, it is a family oriented of event. And, and 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 you know, because of the how we view it, right? That's how we view it, especially if you are a believer. So I know y'all know what I'm talking about. Especially as believers, there is there is something that is so sacrosanct about that moment. Right. And even the way that we process and, and do all of that, the the wake, the what we call uh, the setting up, which where we go, we come to each other's house in the community and we bring over food and we sit and we talk and we laugh and we, you know, we do all of that. All of that is helping. It's supposed to let me say that it's supposed to help alleviate the stress that is associated and stresses uh, that is associated with the grieving moment. And. And so we take that very, very seriously. And what is not needed to add to that pressure is the stress of family bickering and warfare. Family stressing out. And, you know, that is not the time for that. You can't, you can't be there to hold me and help me through my tears if you feel, if you're jealous of me, if you're envious of the relationship that I had with the individual or 
if you feel like you're being left out of the decisions. You know, quite frankly, for me, for me, you know, um, I, 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 it, <laughs> you know, having had to do the five eulogies, uh, you know, and helping to plan and organize all of the programs and all of the obituaries. My brothers, they are more business oriented. I'm the churchman, so I had to do that part. Uh, and, you know, I know, remember when my sister died, which was probably the most traumatic death that I experienced, you know, that was a whole lot because not only was I having to deal with that with her, but I had to make sure that my mom and my dad and all those other people that loved her, I was trying to navigate all of that and, and all of the other kind of, you know, environment and atmosphere that was surrounding that. And you cannot do that when you are fighting, you know, each other. And there was, you know, uh, uh, warfare in the family, right? Warfare outside of the family, in the community, you know, all these different kinds of things. Because that will increase your stress. You will be surprised that how many people get sick, and I'm talking about physically ill, at, 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 in that, during that time of someone else's transition, right? I've heard that the atmosphere uh, was so stressful that people... You know, one person died and because of all of the angst and all of the anxiety and all of the stress that somebody else then had a heart attack and died at the moment of somebody else's death and all that. See, we need to understand as a community, that's a very sensitive moment. That death is a very sensitive moment. Grief, if you don't handle it properly, will take you out of here. That grief, if you don't handle it with expectation and hope, has has the tendency to become a vacuum, a black hole. It will suck you in into a dark place, into a dire place. And sometimes I don't think we we understand that because grief is so very personal to us that that personal, the personalness, if I can use that term, right, became become so very selfish, right? That was my mama, but you're not the only sibling, right? That was my daddy, but you're not the only sibling, you're not the only child, you know? And that was a whole lot, a whole lot to, to, to deal with and to face, you know? And one of the things I can remember that when my father passed away, uh, he had a, a, another daughter, right? That was not, that didn't grow up with my, with my brother and my sister and I. And so, and when I saw her and my mom says, well, we got to contact her because my mom and her had a, a relationship, uh, out, you know, still connected, you know, even though that was not her child. And when I saw her, she looks, she looks more like my dad <laughs> than any of us do. And, and so, but that wasn't the time, my dad's death, cause she was grieving the loss of her father as well. And that wasn't the time to, you know, to deal with their history. First of all, you know, we resolved that that didn't have nothing to do with us. That, you know, she's here when she come around and her children, she looks just like her, us. And we embraced her just like, you know, she was, she grew up with us on Fennec Drive, you know, in Monk's Corner. She, she, you know, we, we, we embraced her just like she walked in with the family. We hugged her and held her. My baby brother, I believe, walked in with her and all, and, or, or, and held her and whatever. We embraced, you know, we cried together. It wasn't time for warfare. You ain't, you my daddy outside child. You this and that. And nobody, nobody got time for that. No. And see, sometimes we pick and choose and allow our emotions to to create unnecessary stress stress around the grieving moment. And we never factor in that that's not the most important thing, that we're going to need each other to make it through this and to survive this moment of the transition and the passing of our loved one. And so I want us to consider the ways in our communities. If you find yourself in various positions and, con and considerations, how we deal with the grief moment and the stress that we can inadvertently add to that moment. I need us to sit in that and think about that because I think we can handle grief uh, in a much better way, in a healthier way. But, you know, it can't be the, 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 the ways of warfare. It cannot be. I'm going to have my say and I'm going to do that. And I'm going to, you, you, you got to, you, you got to be delivered from that. Let me just use some good old church language. Be thou delivered <laughs> because if you're not, you can tear up something and tear up the system of your recovery because you've misused and mismanaged 
the moment of grief. And so that's kind of what we're going to be talking about today, that whole moment, the stress around grief and how we can really navigate through that time. Good deal. Listen, you're listening to the award-winning The Culture Call with yours truly, L. Spencer Smith, right here on Praise 93.3 FM and 790 WTSK. Keep it right here. There's more to come. Don't miss it. Back right here on the culture call with your truly else, Mr. Smith Praise 93.3 FM. And we are having a conversation about stress around grief, or shall I say grief stress? <laughs> yeah, so that we can help each other understand and navigate that tender, sacred moment. Um, one of the things that I talked about on last night um, at, 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 at the discussion. And I want to bring this to bear because I think it's so very important as we have this conversation is, you know, the, the oxymoronic nature of grief because, you know, it, it, it's so, it's, it's so painful. And if you can hear this, uh, it's so beautiful at the same time, you know, uh, for, I know for, for my mom, definitely that the, the moments leading up to it that I had that experience with her, I saw not just my my heart was in pain because I didn't want to let her go, but I saw the beauty and the smoothness of how a saint transitions, how a believer transitions, you know, into eternity. And, you know, it was such a surreal moment that, that I will never, well, of course it's my mother, so I will never forget it. But just, just to see how seamlessly, how, how the, how the spirit let go of the physical body. And it was just, it was just amazing. And one of the things that was so very helpful through that journey um, in 2022, March 28th, 2022. So her, the anniversary of that was last, last month. Um, one of the beautiful things about that was that I had a community around me, not just my wife and my children, but I had my church around me and it was such a healthy time, you know, and when mom transitioned and breathed the last breath, I went out to the lobby and, you know, my church, uh, my church family was there. My, my assistant pastor, my associate pastor was there. My, uh, my assistant that helps me every day was there. My fraternity brother was there, you know, um, all of in my family, my administrator, all of them were at the hospital embracing me and helping me through that journey because my brothers were there. Just, it was just an experience that although it was painful, it, I felt, watch this, here is the word, safe. And I want to talk about that because I think a lot of times when grief happens, for, for a lot of us in our community, we don't feel safe to express. We don't feel safe to, um, to release our emotions in that, uh, in, in that, in that space. And if we're not careful, let's see, let me say this, that grief is an element of life an expression that if you don't give it um if you don't give it voice if you don't give it action if you don't give it release it it doesn't just dissolve it doesn't just resolve itself it stays in you it's hiding somewhere right you know and we had a, a powerful conversation about that last night that you know that it, it with my sister passing away it almost took me out because I was under the mindset from my background, it, you know, uh, don't cry, be strong, don't cry, be strong, do you know, be strong for everybody else. You're the man of faith and power. You're the pastor. You're the, you're the, you know, you're the man of God of the family. And so you got to do X, Y, Z. And everybody else was supposed to, you know, had the opportunity to deal with that. And so, you know, I had my moments of crying, but it wasn't, you know, it wasn't as much as I, pro I, well, not probably, but I should have definitely that the expression of grief uh, inside of me definitely did not find an adequate place to express itself in the public forum, right? Because of all of this pretense and position and posture that you're supposed to have. And, and of course, uh, of, of some of the other things that you know, we say, and I, I want to talk about that because I talk about it explicitly in the book, you know, uh, the things that church people say that really, you know, uh, 
that that's not helpful. That that that's how I'm going to say it. That's not helpful in the grieving process. We really don't know how to help each other grieve, and and I think that's a part of the process of 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 talking to our community because there's a whole lot of people that that grieve, especially over the pandemic. You know, uh, uh, we fortunately my church didn't have a lot of people, but I knew a lot of people that had transitioned that had passed because of the disease, you know, and, you know, that's a very lasting effect. That's the kind of grief because a lot of people, you know, they couldn't really have funerals and home goings like we would normally have it because of the uncertainty of the disease. Um, They had to wear masks. You know, they some had to cremate bodies because they weren't sure of what, how the disease was transmitted early on and, and all those kinds of things. And that grief didn't just dissipate. That grief didn't just, you know, say, oh, well, you know, special circumstances. No, that grief, that pain still torments. I mean, that entire process. And those people, and you know, and, and especially if you're listening to me today and you're one of those people, that grief needs to be vented. It needs to go somewhere. And most of our people, unfortunately, cannot afford therapy, cannot afford, you know, a, a scientific therapeutic place where they can express and handle that kind of grief. So their therapy is their village, is their family. You know, who everybody's in uncertainty. Everybody, you know, there's a, a feeling of not just uncertainty, but un, 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 in no resolve, un, an unfinished kind of business that that grief takes on. And uh, it's stressful. It's a lot. It's a lot. It is a lot. To, to have to see, you know, a lot of hospitals were, you know, uh, wa- allowing families to watch their loved ones pass and take their last breath via Zoom or whatever, whatever uh, virtual f- facilitation that they could. And they never really got to, you know, experience because, again, you know, death requires proximity. You know, it requires the coming together. That's why, you know, when someone is about to transition, we call family in. The doctors call the family in because they know, you know, part of what they learn in medical school as a, as it relates to bedside manner is that death is a relational is a relational uh, situation. It's a family uh, uh, movement. It's a family dynamic. And I think that when we don't, uh, you know, if if if, if, they, if if we don't regard like that as that the medical professionals do right, and of course death is not going to wait for anybody to show up. You know, one of my greatest fears was you know as my mom was getting older, uh, was for me going to her house and finding her deceased, finding her dead, finding her that she had already passed away by herself. You know, with no one that she may have been calling or was she in pain. That was one of my Things, things, and so the way that that transition happened, even for my dad, the way that it happened, it, they, it was with family. It was relationship around them because, again, it is a sacred moment that marks a defining, uh, a defining point in every family existence. And so, I think that is the part and the parcel and portion of of you know that we we need to understand that that death and grief and things of that is a family situation. It's a family orientation. It's not something that, oh, well, no, it's a journey. It's a journey for the entire family. You know that when we finish eating the fried chicken and the potato salad and the corn and drinking our little soda and eating the, you know, the Publix pound cake, you know, people have to go back to try to figure out how to piece their lives together when a loved one has passed away. And, Culture call that can be stressful. You, I mean, you, I know those of you who are listening know what I mean. That can be stressful. That you know, I know the first couple of days I was trying to figure out what do I do, what do I do with all this energy, what do I do with all of this, you know, not just the pain, but what do I do now, you know, what do I, how do I, where do I place this part in my life? Because currently, I don't know. I don't know where it is. I don't know where it's supposed to go, you know, and, you, you know, I, who who do I talk to? Who do I, you know, I, you know, I just went to my, my parents' house and just walked around the house and, you know, just all of that. It was stressful. 
And, you know, um, if I didn't have the, the kind of community, the kind of family, the kind of relationships that weren't pulling on me to be the regular person or to return to the regular person like, you know, oh, yeah, your mama going bye-bye. Oh, yeah, your daddy going bye-bye. Okay, but I need you, but I need you, Pastor. I need you to continue. Pastor, no. One of the greatest things, and I'll say this, um, and I say it in my book, but one of the greatest things that happened to me to help me move forward um, and to and to carry on with life and not get sucked up into the black hole and vacuum of grief was my church did not allow me to be their pastor. They did not, you know, place the burden upon me to be the bishop, you know, that they allowed me to be a son, a grieving son. And that, that, that was, the, they were like, Hey, we all take over. We got it. You know, you done trained a lot of ministers, a lot of them. And I mean, they just stepped up to the plate because they didn't, they didn't say, Hey, well, how are we going to do this without pastor? How are we going to do that? They allowed me to come out of all of those titular responsibilities just to be a son just to be a brother, you know, just to be a father to my grieving children who just lost their grandfather, grandmother, right? And, you know, it was, and that was so very important that if you don't have the kinds of people, especially if you're a pastor, especially if you're a pastor and or a leader or have been the strong one, if you don't have people around you to say, hey, you know what? We got this. Why don't you take a seat? We know you've been going back and forth to the hospital. We know you've been staying up all night, X, Y, Z. We know that you've been doing this and cleaning the house and all that. We know you've been trying to put this all together. If you don't have people around you to say, hey, you know, and I think we stay busy because, you know, if we sit down, we've got to sit in grief. But here's the reality. You better go ahead and start sitting down in it. Why? Because especially when you have help and when you've got resources and relationships that you can pull from because when people go home and they go on with their lives and you know all that kind of stuff yeah then you're going to sit in it and then that thing is going to overwhelm you and you're not going to have that kind of necessary support you know and and so i i get it you know when my when my dad passed and my mama was really fidgety we one of the things we told her sit down we take care of everything yes you sit down and if you feel like crying, all that kind of stuff, if you're doing all that, just do what you need to do. This is your sacred process. This is where your healing begins because they were married almost 50 years. They were made at the year 49. And, uh, you know, and that next year, June, they would have made it to 50 years. And so they were, they were, you know, childhood sweethearts and childhood friends, not sweethearts, but friends. And, and all of that. And so she lost a friend, not just a husband and a lover, but she lost a friend that she knew. So we were like, sit down and, you know, yes, deal with this moment, bask in this moment, relish in this moment, you know, experience this entire moment. It's sacred to you. It's sacred for you. And, and nobody experienced it, you know, his passing like she did. And, you know, as sons, we had to understand that as well. And so, you know, we protected her from people that wanted her to be yeah, Elder Smith, Overseer Smith or what, you know, all these other. No, we, 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 you know, we protected her from people saying all kind of crazy stuff. Don't cry. He in a better place. You know, God had to pick a rose. Like, I, you mean God can't just speak a flower? He got to take my husband, my, my mama, whatever, you know. And we let people get away with that. But see, I'm one of the ones that don't, I don't believe in letting folks get away with crazy stuff. That, nope, that ain't me. I'm that kind of person. That, what kind of sense does that make? Don't cry. What am I supposed to do then? What, what am I supposed to do? Because right now you, you're coming to me because, not because I'm grieving or my potential to grieve. You're coming to me because you can't handle my tears. You can't handle seeing me and watching me grieve and nothing you can do about it. So the best thing you can say is don't cry because I'm uncomfortable with your tears. And that's what a lot of people, they don't want to say that, but a lot of people will tell you, oh, don't cry, don't weep because, because they are uncomfortable with your tears. They don't know how to handle your grief. And the scripture says, hey, here's what the text says. The text says, um, you know, 
that we do grieve and we do weep and mourn, but not at, not like those without hope. The Bible tells us to weep with those that weep and to rejoice with those that rejoice, right? And so there is a special place. There is a place for lamentation. There is a place for the expression of the pain and the hurt that surround and the love that surround the grieving moment. And we've got to make sure that we don't rob each other of that sacred, somber moment because tears do turn into to laughter, right? That you can cry and, and, and sooner or later that your mind, I don't know, it's a, precurious, a curious thing about the mind because you'll cry and, you know, then, 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 then something in your spirit is start saying and, or, or give you a memory or a reflection of that individual that passed away, something funny they said, or memory you should be cherishing because it's a part of that process. And so then you're finding out, you're finding in the grieving moment that yes, I'm crying, but it's also mixed with, with a, a, a joy. And that's the bittersweet context of the grieving moment. And so when you tell an individual, don't cry, you forget that weeping endures for a night, but joy, right? Weeping may, but joy will. And so grieving is this mixture of weeping interwoven with this uh, joy unspeakable that that often comes when you embrace the fullness of the grieving moment, right? And so what we should not do is rob each other of that particular context that we should not rob each other of because we are uncomfortable. Now, I didn't want to see my mother cry. I didn't want to see, you know, when my sister passed away. I didn't want to see the tears of my brothers. Uh, when when my, I didn't want to see the tears of my sibling. I didn't want to see the tears of my wife when her dad passed away. But I was I couldn't be selfish. My my job was to support because each of us felt it in a different way, you know. And you know our job there is to build community. You know, as I said to you before, I had to do all of the eulogies for the five significant, most significant people in my life at the time. And so, you know, I, I remember my brothers were so concerned because of the relationship that I had with my mother, you know, um, they, from the time. I mean, my pastor was checking on me, my wife, my children, my brothers were like, you sure you can do this? You're my sure. And I had promised my mother that I would. You know, she was like, listen, you done preached all these other folks in the glory, you know, during their funeral. Don't you get up here and act like you can't. And I mean, that was one of the charges she gave me while she was in the hospital. She said, don't you get up there and act like you can't preach for me and say my eulogy. You fall out and break down afterwards. But, you know, and I did. But she said, but why are you there? You do what you got to do. And, you know, we have a thing in our family that all three of my brothers uh, all three of us, we eulogized our parents. So all three of my, my, my brothers and myself, we eulogized my dad and, you know, uh, we, we did my grandmother, um, and, and then our mom. And I'll always be the last one because I'm the pastor preacher, uh, and all of those kinds of things. And so they were just really concerned whether I'd be able to hold up in that. But, but after it was all over, I knew that my breakdown had a safe place to express itself. And, and and so that we all cherished each other's grief. My oldest brother had been with my parents the longest. He's the oldest. Um, my baby brother is the baby. I'm the knee child. I'm the middle child, right? The knee baby, what they call him. And so all of us experienced um, our, that relationship in a different facet. And we had to give each other and still have to give each other space to experience that. And that's something that I want to tell you today, Culture Call, is that in that grieving moment, space is necessary and, and, and it's not a competition. It's not a competition to see who can grieve the most or who's hurting the most. No, all of us experience it in different ways. We experience our parents. We experience our, experience our loved ones in different ways. And we've got to make space to allow that expression to exist and to relieve itself. Right. Listen, 205-752-4800. This is the coach call with yours truly, L. Spencer Smith, right here on Praise 93.3. Got so much to go. I need you to keep it locked right here. Don't miss it. This is the world premiere. And we are back. This is the coach call with yours truly, L. Spencer Smith, Praise 93.3 FM, your inspiration station. Yeah, and we are back for the second hour of the talk 
show. Listen, we've been having an amazing morning. Want to send a shout out and a welcome to all of you who are joining us through the 11 o'clock hour. Welcome to the CC family. We are having a very, a very uh, in-depth conversation about grief stressors or the stress of grief and how to navigate that and, and how we can build a community around that notion that helps us uh, make it through and survive grief. Yeah, it's the top of the hour and I'm excited about this 11 o'clock hour. Why? Because, you know, it, it causes us uh, to be able to shift focus. I want to shift a little bit and go a little bit in a different direction. Uh, last night, I'm just kind of recapping what I did on last evening as we had a discussion about my new book, uh, Child Left Behind, uh, for children who have lost both of their parents. But we expanded it to mean more than just that or to talk to just those people who have lost both of their parents, but people who are walking through grief of a loved one. And um, it was a very healthy conversation uh, my wife was my quote unquote Oprah, so she was doing the questioning and interviewing me. Um, and I, I think uh, it's a it's a conversation that we really need to have. I think currently we just we just kind of experience grief how we experience grief. We just kind of try to make it through and um, and try to deal with it culturally how we've always done with it. And you know, every family has a particular way uh, that they deal with grief every every family and i think it's very important for us to be able to to talk about that you know what does that mean what does that look like you know for each and every family and not only what it looks like but how are we respecting that path and making sure that we do due diligence to uh uproot any kind of of mal behavior or mal intent with regards to the the beauty and the sacredness and the solemnity of the moment of transition of a loved one. You know, love defines grief, right? That you really don't grieve people who you don't love, right? Because it's that love that has created this special place for that individual in your life. Um, That when they are lost um, and when they pass, that it creates a particular, you know, sucking vortex. You can feel yourself being sucked into this particular season of life. And if you don't have the proper context or the proper people that can help you navigate that, um, you can get lost in that moment. You can get so deeply lost or it can create rifts in the family um, and I've seen that, you know, that some families don't even talk to each other anymore because the person that was, quote unquote, holding family together passed away. Whether that was big mama or, or you know, grandpa or mama or daddy, whatever that person was, I, I, I witnessed where families, they don't even speak to each other or, you know, because of how that grieving moment was treated um, or, or worse yet, that while that person was living, they were kind of estranged. You know, one of the challenges that I made last night, you know, as we were wrapping up the discussion was, hey, if there's anything you got going on with your mom, your dad, or your loved ones that's keeping you separated, you ain't seen them in a while, you ain't talked to them in a while, let's fix that. Because that is a choice that you are making. And, you know, you can't you can't hold death off or negotiate with death to say, you know, don't take them until I fi- until we fix this, until I'm ready. No, be ready now. Position yourself, or better yet, reposition yourself to where uh, you begin to understand that that notion of that person may slip away at any minute, that they'll be here today and gone tomorrow. And it's that breach in relationship that you will forever mourn, forever mourn. If you don't fix it now, there there are people who you know haven't spoken to their mama in a while. What it, what that looks like, I don't know why. Um, you know, and again, you know, life is a tricky thing because life will make us think that we have forever to fix a thing, when in fact we do not. One of the things that I celebrate, even in the grief of, uh, in the passing and transition of, you know, handling the grief of my parents, is that. For both of them, I have, as a child, no regrets at all. At 
all. I have no regrets on how I treated them. I have no misunderstanding of whether they loved me and they knew that I loved them, you know, right up until the final moments, you know. Um, I have no regret, none at all. And that, to me, is a blessing because I know several people who did, who mishandled that moment and let, you know, a misunderstanding or something left unspoken be the defining signature in terms um, of their life in that relationship. And then that person passed away, and then they spent the entire time, I should have, I should have, I should have. And I'm telling you, uh, re- 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 regret is, you know, is a feeling, is an is an emotion with no rewind. It's no rewind. When you regret a thing, you can't go back and fix it, especially when that person has, you know, passed away. And so, you know, part of part of if the, the healthy grieving process, if you intend to have one, because one of the things I said and challenged that, I prayed that all of them who are parents would 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 one day you know, that their children will one day have to read my book because that the parents didn't leave before the children. Because I saw that when my sister uh, left in her 30s, transitioned in her 30s, and I saw the pain and the agony and the forever, the forever regret, you know, and anguish that was etched in my mother's face. My mother was never the same after that. You know, my dad was never the same after having lost my sister Gwen. And, and, and so... You know, not because they did anything wrong, you know, but just the the parents' loss of a child. That's something totally different. You know, I think to me that's out of order. That's out of spiritual order. That's out of natural order. That's out of soul order for a parent to lose a child, right? So I I, I believe that children ought to lose their parents because that's natural. As we get older, they get older, and, you know, time takes its course on the physical body. I get that. Um, and so why you have a chance, you know, like the scripture says, while today is called today, you know, um, that you fix that, that you pick up the phone, even after this talk show, this broadcast, and you pick up the phone and try to and fix it, you know, as best as you can, because when that death defying a defining moment has come, not death defying, but death defining moment has come that you can do that with no regret, right? That you can mourn the actual season of grief that you're in. You're not mourning, oh, I should have did this and I should have did that. I should have forgave daddy. I should have forgave mom. No, have the hard conversations right now. Fix it now. Make the contact now. Now, I know some of y'all, you're hearing me, but you're like, you don't know. You don't know what they did. You don't know what, you don't know what the issue is. Okay. No, but what I do know is you got a mouth. What I do know is you're feeling it now. What I do know is that's one of the things that's keeping you away. That's part of the breach within your family context. So I do know that now. Yeah, you're experiencing that now, right? So, okay, so since you're experiencing that now, (laughs) right, then let's go ahead and fix it. Fix it while it can be fixed. Fix it or repair it or seek to make it better. Because I'm telling you, at the moment of transition, when 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 uh, when that person stops breathing, you know, and you got to slide them in the boat or lower them into the ground, that is a painful regret that you can't rewind time. You know, Um, it's a difference than missing and regretting. Because that that's a whole stress factor right there. Because when you miss an individual, I miss my dad. I miss my mom. I miss those people who I love that have transitioned. But I don't regret anything in there and, and that we, any kind of relationship that we've had. I don't regret it at all. Because they knew I loved them immensely and the relationship that we had. So missing them is a part of the grieving process. But when you add regret to that, regret is a missing this with a pain connected because I cannot fix what my immaturity would not allow me to do so while I had the chance, right? And so that's a whole nother, a whole nother level of stress and 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 mourning that you shouldn't have to face because you know God has given us all an opportunity to do what we need to do, 
And I know, you know, re- being reared and, you know, especially when you're, you, you, you have these, or you bottle up all these feelings and, you know, you, you're writing, you, you're trying to, I don't know if you plan to write a tell all book or I don't know what you're trying to do. You know, family unions are uncomfortable and you keep you and your kids. Stay away from that. Don't do that. A bishop, you don't understand. No, I get it. I, I, I hear what you're saying. There's some real pain. I'm not minimizing your pain. What I'm saying is seek to fix it, though. I'm not minimizing anything you feel like you've been through. No, I would never do that. No. But what I am saying to you is that you have a responsibility to yourself. Did you hear what I just said? You have a responsibility to yourself to fix some things, to make sure that that transition does not happen. And now you're screaming at a corpse. You're screaming at the ca- the casket. You're screaming at the hole in the ground. And you're, you're I should have, I should have, I should have, I could have, would have. You don't have to live there as long as that person is still alive. Right. Now, if you've never loved them, this is this is a conversation that is, you know, superfluous. This doesn't mean anything. See, but if you love them, because the only reason why you upset is because you love them. Right. And I'm telling you, I'm telling you that if you don't fix it one day, this love is going to produce a kind of grief that births a regret that you can't fix. So hear me while I'm saying it now, culture call. Fix it. Repair it. Do your part so that even if they don't receive it, see, but once you addressed it and once you put your feelings out there and once you, you know, once you've had that, that personal uh, catharsis, that emotional cleansing, emptying of yourself, once you've done that, whether they receive it or not, if something ever happened to them, you can be free and live without regret. You can mourn them, but know that you gave an opportunity to make it right. That's all I'm trying to say. Yeah, that you gave an opportunity to make it right. And so the fact that it wasn't fixed, but it, it ain't on you. Because I did try to call. I did try to come over. I, tri- I did try to, you know, do my part in making sure uh, that, you know, that we fixed it. But don't just sit up here and be like, well, I, I, I ain't the only one. And you know how we, y'all know how we can do us chocolate folk or something else when we want to be. Absolutely. And so we, we definitely have to have this whole idea and this understanding that, hey, I, you know, like they tell us in church, I may not have this chance anymore. I may not have this chance anymore. You know, you may not have the benefit that I had of, you know, speaking to my mom while she was transitioning. You may not have had that, mo- that moment. And And I'm here to tell you that, if you if you miss that moment, it's going to cause a level of distress. It's going to cause a level of distress like you have never experienced it before. Right. So let's let's make sure we, we do what we got to do that we can handle this properly. We can handle it properly. You know, another aspect of something that we talked about is really learning how to create and craft language around the grieving moment because as i said we grieve as a community right that you know and i've been saying that i've said that on other broadcasts and i'm going to say it again that grief and mourning was never designed to be a simply individual thing that you would walk through by yourself right we love the bible but we need to read it we need to read it and study it study to show ourselves approved you know we need to read it and part of that reading is to understand that grief and mourning is a community aspect. Yes, there was an individuality to it, but that we have to, you know, the community and the families of relationships that we build around certain moments in our lives uh, can can make make it, you know, can either help or hinder the healing process, right? You know, that's why, you know, in church, I, I preach things like we need to, a wedding is a community thing. You don't need to keep somebody who you say you love and just pop up in church one day and keep your marriage private. No, it's a community thing. We strengthen each other, you know, um, that, you know, when you have a baby, it's a community thing that we, 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 we just did it this past Sunday. We bring them all together and we, 
as a church family, as a community, you know, uh, as your family and your God, you know, the God parents, and all, we, we have an expression of celebration around that because it is a community thing. And I charge the entire church. I charge the God parents. I charge the, the, the mom, the dad. I charge the grandparents and extended family because, yes, we have a responsibility of a, as a community, right? And so when the time of death comes, that is also a community relationship, right? That we kind of judge the person. And that's why I said the whole idea, the time of how people were walking out the COVID experience. We, 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 you know, where we had to, you know, had maybe have 25 people, you know, that wasn't the sum total, because, you know, uh, of, of major people in our lives. You had to limit the number. No, part of what we do in our community and not just our community, but in other in other communities and cultures, that community is a, a funeral or a, a home going is a time when the entire community comes together as family to reflect on the significance of that that person. You know, the whole community can't be weeping Wanda. You know, Wanda, Wanda was a professional mourner. She just hung out at the funeral home and she was crying for everybody's funeral, whether she had a relationship or not. You know, that's not supposed to be the reality of how we experience that. No, it's supposed to be experienced in the community context. That's why we have, you know, the whole, the you know, everybody gathers. We have the body lying in state and the church packed out, you know, uh, that, 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 you know, church family and all those kinds of things or, you know, you, or the mortuary, wherever we're having it. And then we have people do remarks and we have uh, friends and family and church members. And if they were community people, we have all of that on the program. Do you know why? Because it's a family orientation. That grief and mourning was never supposed to be something that you experience in private. And so because of that, we need to understand the context of how that is supposed to be lived out, how that is supposed to be executed, you know? Um, and, and I think that's very important, right? That that we have to develop language. You know, I've, I've sat through many a homegoing service, of many a funeral, uh, and, and people do remarks, and that is probably the most nerving or better yet unnerving time for me because I'm like, what is this individual getting ready to say? You know, especially when the family hasn't designated anybody, you know, have chosen, pre-chosen and pre-told the person what, you know, okay, you, I just need you to say two, two minutes because that's what we did. That's what we do. You know, I, we have certain people that we knew needed to speak. We told them how long to speak and be done. And if you could be done under those two, two three minutes, that's great. But I've also been to, to homegoing services where they had nobody. And then the, the officiant says, you know, if anybody want to give him remarks, I said, oh, Lord. You know, I always encourage family, hey, don't listen, put somebody's name there. Put, please put somebody's name there. Because I'm the kind of like, okay, let's wrap this up. You know, because they ain't going to take... See, when you don't do that, they ain't going to take no two minutes because there wasn't no thought to it. They weren't already prepared to say what they're going to say. You just opened up the floor for anybody to say, and then you don't know what folks going to say, you know, whether it's appropriate for that setting or something they shared in a private story that should have just been between the person who's deceased and them, and they get up and not in a shame the whole family, shame the person that's deceased, and shame themselves. <laughs> Don't act like you ain't been in them things. You're like, oh, my God. Oh, my Lord. Right? And so, yeah, absolutely. And so we've got to develop language. You know, God does not pick roses. He does not. He does. God needed a flower. And that's a, how's that, how does that help the grieving family that just lost their parent? To let them understand, to, to paint the metaphor that God is a gardener. He needed a flower. God, God needed a flower. And he picked, and out of all the flowers God could have picked, he chose to pick my mama, my daddy, my this, and my that, right? How does that help? No, it's for real, y'all. For real. I, I mean, it's, it's a little tongue in cheek. It's a little humorous. But how does that help an individual? Right? God don't make no mistakes. Okay, I, I get it. I get it from an aspect that we're having a theological uh, a, a conversation about theology when we talk about God doesn't make any mistakes. 
So we, we putting this on God. Okay, I get it. I understand the framework. But the question becomes is how does that help the grieving family? How does that help it? I get it. It's well-intentioned. It is well-intentioned. So you hear me? It is well-intentioned. I get all of that. However, comma, how does that help the family that is in grief, that's in tears now, to know that God don't make mistakes? Right. See, that that what, what are you trying to say? See, because what, was that in question? Right? Or, or we say things like, you know, God took them. And a, a lot of deaths that we attributed to God taking somebody, God didn't have nothing to do with it. That person made a decision. That person made a decision to, you know, drive up, not according to the speed limit, hit a tree. God did that. See, we don't, we need to craft language. And you know what? Some of the best language for a grieving individual or helping people through grief and mourning is the language of silence. Yes, I talk about that in my book. Sometimes the best language you can have is silence. That in the grieving moment, watch this, presence, presence is more important than any words you can say. Right. That, that just be there. That your presence speaks volumes that your tongue and your mouth cannot articulate. Just be there. Just go go by the house and and how you doing? You know, blah, blah, blah. Don't be like Job's friends that are trying to indict. They were trying to be so deep and so religious. And Job was like, yo, y'all not really helping this issue. You see, I'm already sick. You see boils in my body. You see I'm down to my la- on my frame. You see I haven't eaten. You see my wife over there crying because she lost all her kids. And you're going to come with some conversation. Well, wonder what you did wrong that God did this. Really? Uh, is that what we, that's, that's the best we can do? When you can just sit there and, and mourn and grieve with those that grieve. Mourn with those that mourn. Right. If they're praising God, you lift your hands too. Yeah. And rejoice with them that rejoice. That's why I tell you, we, 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 we deify the Bible, but we don't read it. We don't read it for comprehension. We read it for recitation. We read it to, to say it again or to quote it, but we don't read it to understand it. Absolutely. That, that's something that we need to work on as it relates to the community to help people deal with the pain of that moment. Of that moment. That I never want anything to come out of my mouth. Right? That's going to, sometimes the best that I'm here for you. I'm praying for you. And actually be there and actually pray. And that, that could be the, some, don't get to making up lies. You know? Uh, don't try to outgrieve people, other people. <laughs> That's hilarious. Because some folks, yeah, they try to out. Wait a minute. You know, I remember I had people at, at the death of both my mom and dad, what, you know, used it as a point to talk about their situation. I'm like, yo, but this my this my mama. This my daddy. How you going to try to outgrieve me? This my moment of grief. Be here for me. This ain't no comparison. This ain't no contrast. Child, I, I remember my mom and dad. I couldn't make it. And I, how does that help me? How does that help the one, the individual that's grieving? How? Right? Some, some of the best thing you can do is just sit with that person, hold their hand, give them a hug. Cook them some, pup, bring them some public chicken or cook them some chicken or bake them a cake. Take it to the house. And just said, I'm just coming to sit with you. That's all I'm doing. And, and you know, ask them, do they need anything? You know, pray for them. But don't get up there creating, you know, scenarios and bad, bad theology. And here's the deal, y'all. I understand. I have to tell people all this. Stuff. I understand you mean well. I understand. But your means are not well. You mean well. But the means by which you're going uh, uh, to uh, uh, going about it is not well. This is not, this is not a healthy dialogue. 
You're not creating a healthy and safe space for this person to, to grieve and to show their emotions. This ain't a space where you can try to outcry them. You know, um, you know, and, and my family didn't love to tell, you know, funny stories and of that individual, right? Uh, my uncle, my dear uncle, he just passed away uh, last year. Um, but when my, my when both my dad and my mom died, he came to talk about and laughed and caused us to just talk about stories when they were growing up and just funny about my dad and funny about my mom and all that kind of stuff and all that, you know, and and he was just the, the, the jokester of the family. And that's just kind of his space. But he made it, he lifted it up. He lifted us up so much. He was there at the gravesite just embracing us as as comical and as, you know, spiritual as he is. He was just saying, that's my nephew's. And I'm the only one that got left in my daddy's side. Well, I got my other uncle in New York, but you know, I'm here with them now and I'm going to, I'm going to embrace this moment. I, they, I want them to embrace me. I want them to just, I'm just going to hold them and like, like their mom and dad would want me to. And he did. And you'll be, you'll be surprised at how far that simple gesture of embracing these three grown men and allowing us to cry on his arm and his shoulder helped us in that moment. You would be surprised. See, you ain't got to always try to make up something to say because I'm going to tell you right now, you know, if you keep making up stuff to say, folk will be like, look, don't do not do that. Don't try it. Don't. I don't want to hear none of what you got to say. That's how, they, that's how it's going to be. I'm telling you now, that's how it's going to be. And And you need to understand that and 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 take that notion to realize that yeah um they may not need me to say anything right now they they just might need my shoulder they just need the benefit of knowing that somebody is there for them and 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 don't rob them of that yeah let your shoulder be exactly what it is a safe space that i can cry a safe space that I can mourn, a safe space that I can make it through and get over this whole idea of having lost my loved one. And and if you can do that um, for an individual, if you can do that um, to let people know that you're just, whatever they need, we're walking this journey together. If we can do that, see, if we can do that, you will, you will be surprised. You would be so surprised at how helpful that will be to that individual. You will be so surprised to find out that, man, I thought I had to do this. I had to do that. No, all you had to do was be there. That's all you had to do was be there. And they would appreciate that so, so very much. It's the call. It's, it's the, that's the true ministry of compassion. It's you taking that journey with me. No indictments, no nothing. If you can't bring joy to the moment, because a lot of the stuff we do ain't joy. It is not joyous <laughs> at all. And some families don't want to tell you that. But I'm telling you on the culture call today, it ain't joyous. So stop doing it. Stop doing it. Stop doing it. Because grief in our community can be a healthy place, but we got to change some of our practices. We got to change some of what we do to make it a healthy place for one another to be able to say, you know what? This thing hurt you and I'm here for you. This thing is taking you through. I'm so sorry. I hate that you're here. My condolences. Uh, we all loved him. We all loved her. And and we're gonna we we're gonna help you through this moment. And that's what we do for each other. Instead of indicting God or making up, you know, language that's try to sound spiritual but really don't make any kind of sense. Yeah, let's let's stop doing that. Let's let's do this let, let's let's try to do this in the most healthy way that we can so all of us can have a community of, of recovery and restoration from grief. Listen. 205-752-4800. This is your boy, L. Spencer Smith, right here on the Culture Call. Praise 93.3 FM. Listen, I need you to keep it right here. We've got a little bit more to go.
Don't miss it. This is the world premiere. And we are back right here on the Culture Call with yours truly, L. Spencer Smith. And I'm telling you, we've been having an amazing conversation today. Amazing conversation. And I want to use the last few minutes of this particular broadcast, I want to use the last few minutes of it just to kind of talk about resources to help you overcome the stress of grief. You know, as we said at the top of the the show, that grief comes with a certain level of stress and triggers and traumas and stressors that we can ill we will ill a few uh, ill afford to ignore. And um, you know, sometimes. You know, in our community, we don't handle them properly. And because of a lack of financial resources, um, we are not able to get, you know, grief counseling and therapy. Mainly, we get that on Sunday morning or we get that from our pastor. And our pastors may not be uh, academically astute with regards to being able to walk out, help us walk out the processes of grief. And, you, you know, you may live in an area where there are, you know, uh, there are no grief counselors and people that can can help you with that kind of nature and that, that kind of season of life. And one of the things that I I, w- I want to tell you, however, is that you got to build a a resource um, shelf, if I can say that, a resource cabinet or pantry. You've got to build that, you know, as we seek in our community to help each other that the only way that we can do that is number one is honesty yeah what 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 do you mean honestly i'm hurt okay good i get it i understand that yeah yeah honestly you're hurt but here is the reality um that sometimes we're not truthful with the depth of the pain that we do feel and when we are not truthful with that kind of depth of pain that we can find ourselves in a situation where uh, uh, where, where, where we lose our bearing. That's what I want to say, that we'll lose our bearing. And because we don't have the right people, the right resources to help us. But grief is one of those things. The reason why I'm talking about help, finding resources is because grief is one of those things that we cannot and should not handle alone. That I know grief is very personal. It is to me that my journey, you know, daily is very personal to me. It's, it is sacred to me. Um, but, but it is not something that I feel like I have to deal with alone. On those days, you know, um, I tell my wife, I, you know, tell my children who can sense it. I tell, I, you know, I tell my close relationships, hey, today ain't a good day for me. You know, I'm really missing dad. I'm really missing mama. I'm really, you know, X, Y, Z, and they allow me to be that. So, but I have to be honest with them that when they ask me what's going on, I can't just sit there and be like, yo, I'm not saying praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. My savior. Yes, Lord. I don't know. No, uh, -uh. because I'm crying in the inside, but my outside is lying. So it's that whole, now I got to navigate the duplicity. I'm sitting in person who's supposed to be my safe place lying to them when I should be honest and transparent and just simply tell them, hey, I'm having issues today. Today is not a good day, you know, and I don't know what some of your resolves are. I would love to hear some of them, you know, and, you know, how are you navigating grief and how do you navigate? What are some of your resources? You know, books, poems, prayer. I do all that too. Journaling. Yeah, I do that too. But I would love to hear some of your resources, you know, so that we can kind of build a community and let people know that we're not in this by ourselves. Listen, I got a caller on the line. And let me get, hey, Miss Joyce, how you doing? I'm doing pretty good today. How you doing? I'm doing well. It's good to hear from you. What you got it's to say today? It's good to hear from you, too. Thank you, ma'am. And this what I, I'm going to tell you. I'm really enjoying what you're saying about your mother and your father and your sister and your grandparents, how you had to, uh, you know, do the eulogy at their funeral. Yes, ma'am. Oh, I'm just enjoying it. It's blessing and helping me. And I want to I wanna tell you this. After my father passed away, mm-hmm. for two years, over two years, I was grieving. Yeah. And I didn't know what to do. And so I had went to Mr. Fred Brown, mm-hmm. Re- uh, Bishop Fred 
Ed Brown. During that time, he was doing my hair. Mm -hmm. He was doing the Jerry Curls in my hair. And uh, the Holy Spirit showed him that something was going on with me. And he asked me, and I told him, and he told me what to do. He said, you got to pray and give this up and release this. And I told him I didn't know how to release and what to do. Right. So he told me how to pray and what to say when I pray and how to release it. And I did it. And I overcame that grief. Right. Because it was too stressful. It was too painful. And it really hurt me because I was very, very close to my father. Sure. And it hurted me because I was there when he died. And he died with one eye open and the other one closed. And I had to close his eye. Mm -hmm. And then I heard noises. I was in the room when I heard noises. Sounded like a freight train rolling on the track, mm -hmm. shutting down. His body was shutting down. And that was the experience I'll never forget. And people, you love your loved one, you grieve over them, but you got to pray and release and let them go because they go on to a better place. Absolutely. And they wouldn't want to come. Thank you, Ms. Joyce. I appreciate it. Thank you so, so very much. You helped us all this morning. Listen, and like Ms. Joyce said, like Ms. Joyce said, you there's a place in grief where you go forward. You go forward. Because here's what I understand. If that person loved you and you loved them, they would not want you to stay tormented. And that was one of the things that my oldest brother taught me and show and told me because the experience with my sister was really traumatic. Was really traumatic. And he's like, you know, Gwen loved you so much that she would not want you to be in this place of torment. She would not want you to be there. And um, that that whole idea, see, because you know, my only my 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 uh, my only the only thing that we need to understand is that memories, having memories, are is not is not grief. Memories. Is, is, you don't experience memories in grief. You uh, and there's a process, you know. So because you never let that person go. If they were truly a person that you loved, that you never let that person go. And it was it, it's so important that we understand that. And you know because you now you can let you can, and, and say I, I say that very you know not tongue in cheek, but I say that very very pointedly because that memory lives on that 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 memory that you have you know i can remember you know my my mom and i were going to atlanta cuz that's where most of our doctors were the funny conversations and we go out to lunch and you know all those things my i can i can remember the funny things that my my daddy would say would you know hilarious while we were planting you know in the backyard in his garden i can remember the my goodness the funny things my grandparents would say you know all of those memories are uh, are what lives on that the issue is you have to learn how to end the funeral that's what that's what healing from grief is is that you learn how to end the funeral right um and that's important that is important that you learn how to build your life that you can you can and will keep breathing you can and will move on with the memories, the lasting memories, <laughs> the la I mean, and I'm 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 filled with a life of those memories. You know, I told them the story last night that when they called me in the room and told my mom had transitioned, I just rubbed her and rubbed her and just just cried out her name. But I just in that space of time while I was crying out my mom's name, you know, just saying mommy, I was I reflected on all of the memories we had in that span of time, you know. And even today, I've had things that she said and I laughed, you know, she called me over to the house or she texted me and say, hey, mama still lives over here at 1800, you know, <laughs> and and she didn't want nothing. All she wanted to do was see my face and she wanted to tell me something and she wanted to show me, you know, she was really into, you know, studying our roots as our family and she would show me uh, a census from our old relatives you know, when they were in slavery and, you know, all these different kinds of things. And she would show me with such joy. And I would just sit there and listen to it. And she said, well, I'll cook you something. I, you know, and I let her cook me something and I eat it. I sit there and eat it and 
drink a while and we laugh and stuff that was happening and all that kind of stuff. And I listened to it and, and, and daddy would, oh, she, you know, listen, he would always be like, look, come on here and get some of this, this fish, boy. I cook some of this fish, <laughs> you know, and my daddy was the kind of cook fish with the bone in it. Y'all don't do that too much here. I don't know in, in Alabama, but from South Carolina, it was, our, our fish got bones in them. <laughs> and, um, it was just fascinating. It was just, you know, I, and we were sitting, we would eat fish and with the hot sauce and the mustard, and we would just eat some of that. And and he was like, "Hey, somebody brought me some fish," and I told him, "Don't you don't for ladies' fish, leave the bone in it, right?" That was just his whole thing, right? That whatever meat he ate, he had to have the bone in it because the flavor in the bone and the nutrients in the bone, and right. And so it was that kind, those kinds of things. I remember one of our last conversations. He was in our back, and he he did something rarely at that moment. And talked about his childhood. He talked about his father uh, and all how he grew up and how, all these different kinds of things, which and I thought was very interesting because for as long as I could remember that, you know, daddy had never talked about, you know, his family to that depth and to degree. And I was like, yo, wow, this is interesting. And I did certain, certain things that I didn't know. Uh, my grandmother was a nurse and all these different kinds of things. Um, because my grandparents had passed away, his side had already, you know, his real parents had passed away before I, I, I was even born. And so I grew up knowing that his adopted parents, who was his aunt and, his, and, and my uncle, that I, I grew up with, with them understanding that they were my grandparents. So, you know, he just kind of shared that with me and I was so enthralled and I just sat there and helped him pot the plant. And, you know, looking at the garden, he said, yeah, that I'm, I just planted a peach tree back there. And, uh, and you know, it started to, to sprout peaches. He's like, they ain't ready yet. They got a couple more years before that, that you can eat the peaches on the tree. And he given tell me why and all these different kinds of things. And, you know, it, it was, it's those moments that I held on to and I hold on to. And I recall just so, so, so many, um, memories and, I think that's the important part. If you're ever going to recover, that's the important part of of knowing exactly how to move on from the grief and get into the gladness that God has blessed my life with, the, with giving me as a family these people, that God has really, you know, done me a favor by planting me around these people. My sister and I, we used to go sing together and everywhere. She was an amazing singer. And I can remember her at the University of South Carolina, our first time hearing her sing in college. And we were blown away as a family because she invited us and we just thought she was in the choir. And we didn't know she didn't tell us that she had a feature solo. And when they call her name, we thought the folks made a mistake. <laughs> and she opened her mouth and we were like, what in the world? The most phenomenal singer. Uh, I'm talking about, I was like, wow. But it was all those moments that we shared together that are my lasting memories that as I move on, I share them with my children and one day with my grandchildren um, to let them know the, how great of a family that we we are a part of and the connection and the root connection that God has blessed us with. And I pray that you would do that as well as you are looking for resources to how to get over grief. A part of that is pulling from the positive memories that you have um, and working through the, even the negative memories, pulling it all together and making sure uh, that we are, we are what we are, we are who we are need to be and what we need to be for the coming generations as we move forward in grief. Listen, we're almost at the, you know, the landing point at the airport, but I need you to keep it right here on the culture call with yours truly, Elspeth Smith. Praise 93.3. Keep it right here. There's more to come. Don't miss it. Well, my friends, we have had an amazing day on the Culture Call on today. And I pray, sincerely hope, that something that we have said and expressed and shared in transparency and honesty and in love has helped you. I know uh, every day you can't respond uh, on the show, but you see me. You hit me up on the chat. You hit me up on Facebook. And you see me in public like, you know, that show you did on grief, that show you, I'm so glad, glad that you were transparent. And listen, we didn't get on the radio to, 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 to lie or to manipulate or to obfuscate. No, we got on here to help you and empower you 
to be the best that you can be, not just you individually, but all of us as a community, so that we will not be late, last, and lost. I promise you uh, that that is my heart and my desire for this talk show, uh, The Culture Call. I want to encourage you, those of you who are uh, experiencing grief currently, uh, those of you who have been maybe walking the journey through you know, the grief experience and you're at the place where grief has dissipated, dissipated and now it's turned into memories, um, you know, I want to encourage you to say that we are all in this together. That one of the last questions that my wife asked me on last night as she was interviewing me is what was my hope for writing the book? What was my desire? And, you know, I had a few desires. Number one, that that people who are experiencing this uh, know that they're not by themselves. That they know that there are there is a community. There are people that are walking this together. It's not something I know we feel it individually. You know, I know we we have our own individual vicissitudes, ups and downs, our mountains high and our valleys low that we have to experience individually because grief is yes, uh individual experience, uh a very personal in, in experience, but I wanted them to know that as they walk this that they are not by themselves. Number two, I wanted those who may have, you know, have the blessing of having both of their parents uh, still alive, that they they spend the time cherishing the moments, the valuable moments that they still have together. That, you know, adjust, adjust your schedule to make sure uh, that you, you know, that they can, that you actually experience them and they experience you while they are yet alive, that you have opportunities to ask questions and find out recipes and, you know, figure out, you know, why they do a certain thing or why they did a certain thing. Talk about their journeys and all of that. Give That's a part of our inheritance. And then finally, what I said that as we walk in this life, you know, especially for those of us who are believers, especially for those of us who have faith in Christ, the thing that my mom said to me, she said, I know you're going to cry and this is going to hurt you when I go. She said, but you're going to see me in your future. That was one of the most powerful things my mom said. said, She said, so when you're crying, remember me. Remember that you're going to see me tomorrow if you keep your hand in God's hand. And so that's my encouraging thought to all of you that weep, yes, cry, but not without hope. Because our future is is to see them again one day. Absolutely. Listen, as my grandmama, my mama would say uh, at the end of every phone call, I love your bushel. I love your peck. And I love your hug around the neck. This has been the Culture Call with yours truly, L. Spencer Smith, right here on Praise 93.3 FM. Go ahead. Love intentionally. Be kind to each other. Find a place of peace. That's right. And treat each other well. Y'all be blessed and have a great day. Y'all make sure that you tune in tomorrow to the Culture Call and don't miss not a show. God bless you. Love you so much. Peace.